Hey, what's going on YouTube? You're gonna wanna stick around for this because today I'm gonna cancel myself. That's right, you heard me. I'm gonna build a case to get myself canceled. And this should be relatively easy. You can ask some of my family and friends. See, for many, many years, I was an alcoholic. And my choice of drink was Jack Daniels. At one point, um, people were calling me Jack Daniels Josh. See, I turned into a different person when I was drinking. I didn't even know who I was anymore. There's a reason at the liquor store why they call it wine and spirits. And I acted like a jerk to everyone around me. Sometimes I would even mix drugs in with the alcohol. Because that's what you do when you're hanging out with people in bars. People that aren't going any place with their lives. And it caused me to destroy a lot of relationships wherever I went. Sometimes I would get into physical fights with people while I was drinking. And it could get ugly. You know, one time I was at a bar and this guy was um, harassing some of the girls I was with. And in two seconds, I just dragged him out of the bar and, and threw him into the street. I had a huge anger problem. Because I never dealt with any of the hurt and pains in my life. I just kind of just figured... You just got to keep going. And I never took time to face any of it. So it left me angry. And I often lashed out on people. The people I loved the most. I struggled with anxiety and depression for many years. Just trying to find my way in this world. And I was seeking God the whole time. Saying, God, what do you want me to do? Where, where do you want me? But I couldn't figure out. I was a complete nightmare in romantic relationships for many reasons. I was controlling, jealous, and even abusive. Because I was insecure and unable to handle my emotions. And I probably damaged a lot of women. My sexuality was out of whack. I was over preoccupied with sex. Would have sex with a woman and just never talk to her again. I often watch porn. And really now that I look back on it, I was just trying to find satisfaction. I was just trying to find comfort. But I never found my fill with those things. Because of all of this, I was arrested several times and had to spend the night in jail. And that comes with legal problems and more importantly, legal bills. But I guess one of what I want to get across to you today is more than all of this, is really underneath all of it all, I was in a lot of pain. I did not know how to handle the grief, the grief and the loss that I had been through. I lost a few friends in high school to tragic circumstances. In junior college, I lost two of my closest friends at the school, various circumstances. One of my friends was shot. Even if I, after I graduated with college at NYU with honors, I had eighty thousand dollars in debt and the bills were so high I didn't know what to do I was in a lot of pain and see hurt people end up hurting other people not because they are bad but because they are operating out of a place from those wounds and hurts from the things inflicted on them 
And that's part of the reason why cancel culture is so toxic and wrong is because the Bible says that we've all fall short of the glory of God. I had so many wounds from the past, relationships that went wrong or friendships where I was betrayed or circumstances that didn't work out and I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't paying attention to my tears. I kind of quote a Bible verse and go on. But yet deep underneath it, I had these wounds. There's a scene in the gladiator where the king stabs the gladiator, Maximus, and then he makes him put his armor back on and pulls him in front of the Colosseum to fight him. But the crowd don't know that Maximus has been stabbed. This was like me. I had all these wounds that I concealed and no one else could see. But deep beneath my armor, I was bleeding. I often misinterpreted what God was trying to do in my life, making the situations worse. See, the Bible says that God disciplines those He loves. And if you're not very, if you're not very careful and discerning, you could misinterpret that discipline for punishment. The Bible says this, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And that's part of the reason why I'm doing this video today, why I'm making this argument to cancel myself. It seems unnatural or counterproductive to confess your sins to other people. But actually, the complete opposite is true. It sets you free. James also says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. See, in the Protestant church, I was raised to say, oh, you just have to confess your sins to God. And that's not always the case, especially if those sins involved other people. Unless you confess your sins to God's and other people, He can't help you or heal you. So my life finally hit a collision course in 2015 where I lost everything. And I checked myself into rehab and I said it's time to get sober and clean so I could get my clear thinking back. And now that I look back on, on it, those three, those three weeks in rehab were like Jonah in the belly of the whale. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I got my mind back. I got my wits back. But I had to acknowledge my sins. I had to face the things that I've done. I had to feel deeply sorry for the things that I've done and ask God and when possible, ask certain people for forgiveness. For all the people that I hurt from a place of my own pain, I want to say today that I am really sorry. I am really sorry. I was not self-aware. I was not humble. I was denying my pain. And to anybody I ever hurt, I am deeply sorry. I never meant to do that. You know who you are. The people that I hurt, they know who they are. I feel truly sorry from the bottom of my heart. Now, after I acknowledge my sins, confess to other people, and sometimes high-level church leaders, very embarrassing. And I made a decision with God's help to not repeat those bad behaviors and turn from all wicked ways. Derek Prince, one of my favorite preachers who pioneered the deliverance ministry, he was way ahead of his times, said his whole ministry started based on one revelation during being a medic in World War II. One day, while he was on the job, his job was to bandage the wounds of the soldiers. He was putting a dressing on a wound. 
And the doctor turned to him and said, Derek, you're going to kill these people. You're going to kill these soldiers. You're putting bandages on the wounds, but you first didn't take out the metal inside. And in this case, it was a bullet. No, you've got to go inside the wound, get the metal out, sew up the wound, and then put bandages on it. See, a lot of what's going on today is we're just putting bandages on the outside of wounds, not really going deeper. And this started Derek's ministry, knowing that God was going to call him to bring healing to many people. But it was only going to happen by going deeper. Many years of church and therapy could not heal all these wounds. They couldn't get to it. I was an avid church attender. I went to therapy with several therapists. Especially the church these days is very shallow. The Christian church these days is very shallow. They might deal with less than 10% of the real issues that I was facing. And 90% of it went unchecked. But I'll tell you what, if you turn to God, the Bible says in Psalm 147 verse 3, that He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up their wounds. He can heal you if you're brokenhearted today. He can bind up your wounds. And what man can't do, God can do. Only God was able to give me the deep healing that I needed. So after rehab, I committed my life completely to God, 100%. I was taking this class with Mark Battison called All In. And he said, in your Christian life, you have to go all in. There were missionaries in one particular region, and they would bring caskets with them. And they said, God, I'm not going to leave here. And if I leave, it's going to be in this casket. I will be successful in reaching these people. And I knew that God was calling me to go all in, past the shallow Christian culture that we're in right now would sing a few songs, listen to an inspirational message, and say hi to a few people, and go home. I started uh, being at church whenever I could, Bible study, prayer meetings, worship nights, and I started really taking classes. There was one uh, class called Divorce Care that helps you heal from the wounds of divorce. And I ended up helping lead that Bible study. And then I went to emotionally healthy discipleship and stuck around so long until I eventually became one of the leaders in that preaching and teaching, even with the author. There were two things in emotionally healthy discipleship that I need to tell you about today. You want to listen to this. Listen to the whole story. I misinterpreted what God was doing in my life completely. That's why my life had become such a wreck. There's a concept in Emotionally Healthy Discipleship called the wall. And it's this place where God leads you to a dark night of the soul. You're serving for Him, you know Him, but now He's calling you to grow up and mature. And if you misinterpret what He's doing at the wall, you think that you're in trouble, that God doesn't love you. But what he's trying to do is overthrow your will so that his will could be done. So he places walls, blockages in your path that you can't go any further. You can't get past these things without God's help. The author of EHD states that 80% of people in their Christian life are stuck at the wall. They never get past the challenges because they're not seeing the blessing in the challenges. On the other side of the wall, there's no pride. You've been stripped of pride. You've been stripped of emotionalism. 
and you know that it's only God that got you through that wall. If you're facing a situation right now, I pray that you would stand up and face that situation and not run from it. Face your wall and ask God what He's trying to teach you in that lesson. Another thing from Emotionally Healthy Discipleship is how to deal with grief and loss. You know, in the Christian life, you hear all the good inspirational messages, but nobody ever talked about the failures. Nobody ever talked about what happens when God doesn't answer your prayers. What happens when you've been praying for two or three years and it doesn't happen? What happens when you lose your job or you get sick? There was no discipleship in that area. One third of the Psalms are laments of David crying out to God. There's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations, which is just about grieving. Yet in today's Christian culture, we treat grief and loss and pain like it's an alien invasion. Yet this is a part of life, even the Christian life. And so I started facing my pain, grief, and loss, not running from it. And the truth is, is that grief, pain, and loss don't have to make you less. I'm here today to declare to you that grief, pain, and loss could be God's gift to you to usher in His power and His grace in your life to usher you to a new place. Grief and loss could make you more, not less, if you don't get bitter with God and quit. There was another program that I was involved with called Desert Streams Ministry. And it has a one class called Living Waters. And it helps to heal the sexual and the relational broken. And they get to the deeper levels in your life. And then eventually I took that material and brought it back to my church and was able to help so many people. But while I was there, they were digging into my life with counselors and spirit-filled prayer counselors that were looking deep into my life with the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, pulling out different wounds, different places where I was wounded, different places where I was hurting, facing it. And it was the Holy Spirit revealed things. They also encourage you to confess your sin. And while I was there, one of the counselors brought out one of the major sins in my life. And since it's sexual in nature, I'm not going to share that with you today. I might another day. But this counselor said, okay, it's time to share with the whole group. What? There's 10 other people there. Why would I do that? God was exposing the motives of my heart. How not only the things that I was doing, but the in the intention that I had with these things was just wicked. And I asked the prayer leader, I said, um, you know, is there any way I could just confess these sins to me at you at lunch? And he started laughing and he goes, no, that's not the way you work. And I got in front of that group and I confessed the sins. I was obedient to God. And when I did, the weight of the world came up to me. And actually one of the men who was a PhD in psychology came up to me and goes, Josh, I respect you so much. Yo, I have three daughters and I would let her marry a man like you because you faced your demons. You faced the bad things about yourself. And so there was that desert stream chaining where they went deeper. There was confession of sin. God revealing where wounds and where things went wrong in my life, even in early childhood. Then I started getting involved in the inner healing and deliverance team in my church. And I came to every single meeting. I took notes, I listened, I studied. Then Ken Fish started helping, discipled that group. And he was um, you know, doing seminars with us and giving us teachings. And we would also catch up with his teachings whenever he was in New York City. And I learned everything I possibly could learn about inner healing and deliverance. Just a side note, for people that just teach deliverance with no inner healing, I'm going to tell you, I don't think that's correct. Because they often cast demons out of people, 
but they haven't dealt with the chronic hurts and issues on the emotional realm, which is inner healing. You need both. And eventually ended up help being one of the key leaders on that team, dealing with real darkness in people, casting out demons, people forgiving and getting emotionally healing. And then one other thing, mentorship from church leaders. I chased down all five or six of the pastors at my church, determined to get prayers, help, counseling, mentorship. And one of the pastors in particular, named Peter Roden, really took a liking to me, took me on like a son. And I'll tell you what, it made all the difference in my life. He said, Josh, those things in the past, that's not your identity anymore. You're a new man. And I confessed the deepest, darkest sins in my life to him. And he said, I still love you. You are my son who I love and I am well pleased with, like the God the Father told Jesus. So I got mentorship from every pastor I possibly could. Just even if they would give me 10 to 15 minutes, I would chase them down. I'm going to begin wrapping up right now, so just stay with me another few minutes. But 1 Corinthians 9, I'm sorry, excuse me. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, my brother-in-law put me on to this verse. You're going to want to hear this. For do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immorality, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, or the greedy, or drunkards, or slanderers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So if you don't like who you are today, there is good news that God can help you to change. And He can wash you and clean you and sanctify you and justify you by the power of His Spirit. It is possible to make a complete turnaround. I lost everything. And the Lord picked me up, embraced me, put me back on my feet, put His Spirit in me, and now I've been teaching and preaching and helping out in over 10 different ministries. But you must be willing to face yourself, confess your sins, turn from wicked ways, and trust God to help you change your life and lead your life. See, in American Christianity, a lot of people love the concept of Jesus as their Savior. But very few people want to really take on Jesus Christ as their Lord. They are following Him. The Bible says this, As far as the east is from the west, which is infinity, so have I removed my transgressions from you. I've placed it in my sea of forgetfulness. It says in another place, Though your sins were like scarlet, I have washed them, and you have become white as snow. Another verse, that God has the power to save you to the uttermost. See, the first 20 years in my Christian life, God only really transformed a small part of who I was, and I was a monster in the rest of my life. And I missed out on a full healing. God can save you to the uttermost, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. A complete work in you. And does that mean that we're perfect? No, I make mistakes. I still struggle with anger at times. I blow relationships at times. But I'm nothing close to once I wa what I was. I'm straining towards what is ahead. David said this, that even if my mother and father forsake me, Lord, you will not forsake me. 
God gave a promise to us, even in these dark days, even in these very dark days, that He would never leave us, even to the end of the age. I'm closing up right now, but this was something that I was introduced to while I was in rehab by one of the counselors, and it's called the Jail Warden's Bible. He was in jail, and he gave this to me. And basically, it is a jail warden came to him and said, well, you know, because you committed crimes, then basically that discounts you in your life. You're a violent man. You can't do anything. And then he brought to him the jail warden's Bible. And the jail warden Bible is every chapter in the Bible ripped out by someone who committed violent crimes, particularly acts of murder. So many of you don't know, Moses was a murderer. So let's rip out the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Take that out of the Bible. God can't use him. He was a murderer. Then take out all of the Psalms because David was a murderer and an adulterer. And so he took out all the book of Psalms because God can't use him either. He's a murderer. And then, wait a minute, hold on. Let's take out all the letters that Paul writ. Let's rip them out of the Bible. Paul was a murderer. He killed Christians. He was a violent man. Oh, and let's not forget about Peter, who took out a knife and stabbed someone when Jesus got crucified. Got to take out the book of First and Second Peter, too. And so you see how ridiculous this is? Where everybody is getting canceled? Yet a quarter of the Bible was written by murderers. Look at this, look at this book with, with the books of the Bible that were written out. It's a quarter of the Bible going with people that were murderers. And so this idea of canceling people because they've done things in the past, it's crazy. I'm here to tell you today, and I'm closing right now. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you've been, who your family is. Your past mistakes do not have to define you. No matter what culture says, God will not cancel you. God loves you and he wants to give you a clean slate and a fresh start today. And he can do it. Let me just close in a prayer. God, I'm thanking you that I was able to confess my sins here today to the youth to the YouTube community just to say in your word that whoever confesses their sins they will be forgiven and cleansed and so I'm encouraging people to confess their sins to get it out so they can find forgiveness Lord I thank you that you took my life that was a wreck and you turned it around and you put me on my feet and you put me on solid ground and you put a new song in my heart and you gave me a new praise and a new step and a new confidence and you put your spirit on me with boldness to go out and teach and preach and help others now for several years. If there's anyone out there today that's done horrible things, terrible things, they're lost, they're hurting, they're wounded, your message is to them is come to me today my son. I want to help you out but you got to turn away from sin. You got to acknowledge the things and you got to reach out and take God's hand and he'll come and he can heal your broken heart. He can bind up your wounds. He can fill you up again and put you back on your feet again. And if that is the case for anyone out there, God, I'm praying that you would just hit them with your spirit right now. Tell them there's a chance for a new beginning, a chance for a hope, a chance for a future. And this could be their moment. And I say that in Jesus name. Amen.